Uh, I'm Perry Marshall, and I'm here with Joanna Xavier. And so, Joanna, and in, in Portuguese, it's Joanna Javier, right? Could, could you say it correctly? I can, yes, although I don't mind, but it's Joana Xavier. Okay, well, that's beautiful. Um, I, I think Xavier is a great name in English. It's even a better name in Portuguese. Um, Joanna is an origin of life researcher at University College London. She works for Nick Lane, which is, uh, he is a very famous origin of life guy. And I met Joanna at Stuart Kaufman's origin of life discussion at his home three years ago. Uh, and there was a bunch of really high octane people uh, at that meeting. There was Paul Davies, Sarah Walker, Lee Cronin, Stu, Addie Pross, and you know, these are all very respected people. I wanna say, Joanne, you were probably the youngest person in the room, is that correct? I believe so. Male was there as well, the young philosopher from France. I don't know how old he is, um, but we were both probably. I was certainly the youngest, most active. <laughs> I found that Joanna had a very extensive knowledge of the literature and the problems. And as we're going to get into in our podcast discussion, a much deeper recognition of the unsolved problems than most people. And so I hired her. She is on the review committee for the Evolution 2.0 prize. And any submissions that are above a certain level, like pass some basic uh, entrance requirements, they go to her before they go to any, anybody else. And so she has been very instrumental in the Evolution 2.0 prize process. And um, she has a paper that I would like to talk to you about. And it is called Small Molecule Autocatalytic Networks Are Universal Metabolic Fossils. And it's published in the Journal of the Royal Society, co-authored with Stuart Kaufman, who uh, he, we mentioned him earlier. He's a very famous scientist uh, with a very enviable track record. And so uh, Joanna is mixing up with the best people in the business. And we're here to talk about origin of life today. And so I would like to start, Joanna, by putting something on the screen. Um, this is an M.C. Escher drawing of hands drawing hands. And uh, that is my best explanation for what an autocatalytic network is. Um, and uh, Joanna, let, let's just, why don't you run with that? Uh, can you explain why a hand drawing a hand is an apt analogy for the problems in the origin of life question? Sure, Barry. I mean, when, I, when you put it up, I was completely reminded of life itself, right? This is what life does. It creates itself. And that's why autocatalytic networks were so interesting for me because they are a simpler version of a self-reproducing complex system. And so in autocatalytic networks of small molecules of the kind that I study, we're talking about molecules of the size of vitamins, uh, amino acids, and those engage uh, in a, let's call it a molecular dance, um, where they interact and reproduce. And uh, there are interesting energetic processes and redox transfer processes occurring within the network that, that are very important for cells as well. And that's why we are so excited with these networks and hoping to see them in the lab sooner than later. So could you give a very basic example of parts of the reproductive and cellular process where a 
makes B and B makes C and C makes D, but D is required to make A. And can you just outline maybe the simplest version of that that a casual listener could understand? Well, with small molecules, um, it's going to be a relatively complex uh, and, and weird name. So let me try to, to do it with what happens in the cell. You need proteins to make DNA and you need DNA to be expressed into a protein. And that's the deepest chicken and egg uh, problem in the cell. So there are similar occurrences with small molecules. You need ATP. Uh, which is the central currency of energy in any cell um, to make more of the molecules that then lead to the production of ATP. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that would be probably the most interesting example that our work also explores, the, the production of ATP and NAD. These are the universal currencies for any cell of energy and redox power. Um, respectively. So, so I, they, they are always intertwined in their own production through complex and large networks. That's why it's a bit hard to reduce them to just a few. So I remember reading a history of the computer microchip and the, the very first ones came out in the 70s. And the article said, you know, it's kind of hard to design a chip without a computer. <laughs> and it's kind of hard to have a computer if you don't have a chip, and, right? And so, you know, even just making the first integrated circuit was one of these chicken and egg things that was very hard to get over with a cell. It's about 100,000 times as complex. And what you're saying in this paper is that there were, you studied 6,600 microorganisms and they all they all had a similar family of reactions yes correct can you explain like what does that what does that mean uh, um relative to you know, we're, we're trying to imagine the earliest life and then blossoming out into more and more life forms so what does this mean well, but it means that it has been known for a while that prokaryotes, which include bacteria, so unicellular cells, the simplest we know, that it has been known for a while that they share a lot of chemistry. So we knew that they all use ATP as we do uh, and amino acids as we do. Uh, the interesting thing now with this and the previous papers, we see that not only they share them, they share the way they are organized in the metabolic network, the way that they interact and the way that we postulate that they would have interacted before the advent of complex coding. We are postulating that these networks, because they are shared universally across these 6,600, they point to a root, a very deep root in the origin of complex chemistry. Now, of course, we need laboratory demonstrations, but it's very exciting to see that it's so universal, the way that these networks are organized. And, and we believe it's a palimpsest. It's It has to point to the possibility of them being there before the code. And is that a surprising result? Or is that different than what some people expected or what you expected? Well, I would say for me and Stu, it's not really surprising. Uh, we have been thinking, Stu, for decades and decades, has been thinking of autocatalysis and complex cooperative processes for a long time. But for many others, it is. Um, I would say many people still like very much the idea of a self-reproducing RNA molecule, which is very appealing. Uh, but we don't need to go into the details of why the RNA world theory is appealing, but the fact is that even if an RNA molecule would be self-reproducing, it still needs its building blocks and energy. And this part has been missed uh, by many 
people or they just didn't focus on that part. And our, our results solve a bit of the self-reproduction of uh, building blocks and energy. So for people who are not deep into origin of life literature, which is most people, can you just briefly outline what the RNA hypothesis is? And then I have a little story that might get us to the next step. So why don't you help us understand what that means? Yes, so RNA is a very interesting molecule. In the cell, it's uh, very transient, except in the ribosome, the ribosomal, uh, ribosomal RNA. But it's a molecule that does a lot. Uh, and as soon as people found that it can act as a catalyst, uh, as well as having information, because it is a strand of code, uh, people were really excited and they thought, well, this means that it can catalyze reactions and it can carry information. So this must have been a molecule very early at the origin of life. And I, I must agree, it's a very appealing theory. The problem is when you think about a cell, a cell is way more than RNA. And we have to think of how to link that theory of a naked RNA molecule to a whole cell. Well, now, many people don't want to do that because it's just exciting to live in that world. <laughs> but <laughs> well, ultimately, we have to do that leap. Well, tell me if I'm right or wrong, but my understanding is that um, a lot of people think that since they've been able to get RNA molecules to uh, where the, the chemicals match and then they make another R RNA molecule and another one and they can uh, it's almost like crystals replicating. You can get millions of RNA molecules um, and, and you can get variations of RNA molecules. You get something that has a resemblance to how evolution is described. So we can generate many, 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 many kinds of RNA molecules. And so the reasoning is, well, one of these must have had the right code and then turned into a cell. It, uh, is Somehow. that about right? So, so, yes. So can you shine a spotlight on, so what exactly are they skipping over with that explanation? Absolutely. So we need to think where do the starting molecules come from? How do we have the monomers for the RNA? And we need to think of the energy required for that mm -hmm. process. So those kinds of experiments are done in the lab with a lot of human interference, right? They are in a controlled environment. Everything is done in the right way so that reactions happen. But the way to think of the origin of life is to think of a geochemical setting in which those things could have happened. So that, that is crucial. We have to think, where are the building blocks coming from? Where's the energy coming from? And what is the geochemical niche where this could happen? And then of course, to go all the way from just a self-replicating RNA molecule to a cell, you need to ask then how do proteins come in the scene and take over and completely catalyze everything in cells? How does a membrane come in? When does a membrane come in? Is a membrane essential for this whole thing? Or can the RNA just do that with the rock? There are thousands of questions uh, that spark in one's mind when you're reading about the RNA world uh, and just starting unbiased. <laughs> well, I was in London last fall and I was overhearing you talking to Derek Dearden about this question. And he's an engineer and he asked about well, you have to have energy to make that happen. And you said, yes, engineers always ask, where does the energy come from, right? And so not only do you have the question of where do the molecules come from to make the RNA and how does the environment stay safe enough and stable enough for this to happen? How do I get a cell wall to protect it all? And where do I get the energy? Because um, just because energy is floating around doesn't mean energy is useful. 
Uh, engineers take okay. thermodynamics and they find out, oh, there's this concept called an engine. If you know anything at all about an engine, you, you actually understand something about energy. Well, fuel's got to go in somewhere and then it's got to be consumed somewhere else. And it's, it's got to like, it's got to go from A to B and not from B to A. Yes, and that's exactly what happens in cells. Now, one thing that happens, Barry, is a lot of people, chemists, physicists in, in the field, um, whom are extremely important to, to be in the discussion. But they often tell me, oh, if you're thinking about the cell in the context of the origin of life, it's like reading Shakespeare and trying to infer the origin of language. Now, that is a very appealing analogy. Um, <laughs> it's a clever analogy, too. Okay. It is. I've, I've heard it in Santa Fe. But I, I think it's a bit unfair because we don't know any other thing that is alive than not a cell. And that's why I love bacteria. They are still very complex, but they are way simpler than a human or a plant. So for me, it's let's just get into bacteria as much as we can. And then when I meet synthetic biologists, bioengineers, biotechnologists that are working in really building these things and putting them together. That's when the real juice comes out. That's like when you see, oh, that's how you can get a minimal system. But still the minimal systems we know, even from that um, current of work, they are very complex. So that's the gap we need to bridge between geochemistry and a minimal cell. So I want to read a couple of things from your paper. Um, so you, you talk about going from chemical, just chemicals to chemicals that have instructions. And you say that moment, the origin of a primitive code is seminal in biology, perhaps like no other, yet it remains a deep mystery, the complexity of which remains unmatched by any known non-living system. And that's like, that's the first paragraph of your introduction. Um, and you're talking about the origin of the genetic code, which is what the Evolution Prize is all about. Um, and then you say the process of coding seems irreducible involving hundreds of encoded proteins. This makes life encoding self-referential while also requiring all other processes the cell needs for energy. The smallest no self-replicating cells known um, have genomes with approximately 112,000 base pairs and hundreds of thousands of RNA molecules. So really you've, you've stated, like you've gone right to the heart. This is the hard part of the question right out of the gate. You haven't skirted around it. I, I find a lot of people, they just kind of, they just slide around these questions like, well, let's not deal with that right now. Let's just, but you didn't do that. Yes, I'm trying to create an incentive, Barry. I want people to, so I want us as a community to look at this question and solve it. Um, uh, our paper doesn't begin to solve the origin of the code. Um, it's just a little help from the point of view of chemical engineering uh, as to how a network could be a primordial engine for the origin of the code. But the reason why I started the introduction talking about the code is because, hey, let's walk there. Let's walk together towards that goal. And I'm hoping that the community can take this question more seriously um, now, like really take the complexity of at least a triad of protein, RNA, small molecules, and of course, the membrane. We cannot just study one molecule without at least talking to others that are studying others. Mm -hmm. I think the goal would be, of course, having a, an experiment with as many of those as possible, but we have to at least talk and we have to face it, face the complexity of a, of a cell. That's why I put those numbers right out, out of that. Like, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. How many are we talking about? How many proteins? How many lipids? I think it's important. Well, it's a daunting problem. And it's kind of like, how do we get to the moon? Well, I've got a stepladder. I've got a crane. Um, I got I got a drone in the garage. Um, I've got a kite. Um, I got some fireworks. Like, well, okay. Uh, whatever we got is what we got. Let's go. And, yes. and I, I think this um, this really brings us to the elephant in the room with origin of life, which it didn't take when I went down this rabbit hole about 18 years ago, it didn't take me very long at all to figure out. Nobody really has any idea where life came from when you get right down to it. Um, there's lots of theories, but and, and but then there's this very bitter blood match um, in in the popular conversation, right? So you have the intelligent design in the creationist community who at the end of the day, they say, well, God did it. You guys can't solve it. Fess up. That's kind of what they say, right? Um, and the scientists say, well, you know, I can't uh, exactly get a paycheck for doing research by, like, I couldn't put God did it in a scientific paper and publish it and get paid. Like, why, why would you pay anybody to do that? Like, we have to make tangible progress. And so you, you've got these two sides. Um, and I came to feel like th there, there needs to be a way of bringing these two views together. Um, because I was initially very sympathetic to the intelligent design side. And even today, I would still say I, in some ways, am. But I'm fully sympathetic to the fact that a science has a scientist has to do his job and that uh, cells run on processes. And our job is to understand the processes and not just resort to metaphysical or philosophical assumptions, right? And um, it's very useful to understand those processes. It leads us to fantastic like mRNA vaccines and, and so on. So can the you more we understand- on that, please? Um, can, I don't know that people are aware that origin of life research does produce useful things that the world can use. Can you- Yes, of course. I mean, any understanding in the origin of life research is fundamental biology like no other. It's fundamental, it's the root of, of the tree. And it applies to mostly everything that, that we see today. Um, I mean, the work that I've done with vitamins, with prokaryotes that seem to be universal and that I'm saying, hey, these vitamins were there very early at the origin. They are the same vitamins that are essential for us today. Niacin, uh, vitamin B6. And so that's one good example. Another good example, if we, find a way to produce those vitamins like the earth did back then. It's another process to, to manufacture a really expensive product. Mm. And like these are, there are thousands of applications, uh, delivery uh, with peptides. The work with peptides has been expanding massively in Europe. There are tons of new companies um, and, and, Work with peptides is extremely relevant for the origin of life. And I, I think we'll see more and more of these um, bridges. That's also one, one of the things I'm trying to do with my work and my outreach work to let people know, listen, this is important for so many reasons. And we need to get back to value, value those uh, very fundamental studies. And yes, mRNA vaccines just knowing what RNA is, how it works, um, its stability, all of these questions are important for the applications of RNA and for what RNA did at the origin of life. So Joanna, is it fair to say that 
if you pursue um, these very basic molecular systems far enough, eventually these inevitably turned into medicines, insight into nutrition, ways of treating disease, manufacturing processes that could uh, help things that making plastics or all, it, it, is that right? Absolutely. I strongly believe so. I mean, I'm a bioengineer. I, I, I chose bioengineering for a reason. It was I wanted the tools to understand life. But at the same time, I got to learn how I can apply the knowledge that I get with those tools very easily. And we're talking about thousands of applications, possible millions, I don't know, and really impactful ones. So one of the ways that I try to think of this to bridge these two views is that design is a lens, not an event. And it's also a capability of cells. So cells redesign themselves, which is another hand drawing a hand thing, right? The DNA builds the cell, but the cell modifies the DNA and it changes the next generation. I mean, this is all of it is mind blowing stuff if you attempt to wrap your head around it. It's just wow. It is. But about intelligent design, let me tell you, Perry, um, I read uh, Signature in the Cell by Stephen Meyer. Is that mm -hmm. his name? Yes. 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 And I must tell you, I found it one of the best books I've read in terms of really pointing putting the finger on the questions. Yes. What I didn't like was the final answer, of course, but I actually tell everyone I can, listen, read that book. Let's not put intelligent design in a spike and burn it. Let's understand what they're saying and engage. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a really good book that really exposes a lot of the questions that people try to sweep under the carpet. It just answers it like with this, it's not, yeah, I, I think we must have a more naturalistic answer to these processes. There must be. And Otherwise, I'll be out of a job. <laughs> and Joanna, from, from what I understand about you, your objection to Stephen Meyer's answer is not that you're opposed to spiritual viewpoints. It's that... Absolutely. It's that we have a job to do and intelligent design misapplied takes a job away from a scientist. Absolutely. I mean, I think we can explore metaphysics and the complexity of metaphysics without resorting to the unanswered question of the origin of life. I don't think we need uh, the complexity of the cell to affirm certain metaphysical viewpoints. Um, so, so indeed, I, I like to see myself as a very open-minded person in terms of metaphysics, but that's not to say that the study, molecular study of a cell should just end. I don't even think the, the ID people want it to end. It's just the, the pressure to accept that there is no answer through naturalistic means that I'm a bit against. Yeah. Well, in, the way I would describe it is I believe the universe is divinely ordered. And the order is dis in layers and layers. It's, it's always discoverable. There's always another layer and another layer, another layer that you can discover. And so, well, in, in 1843, we didn't have any way to get to the moon, but we did get to the moon in 1969. And we got there by a combination of small steps and quantum leaps, right? It, it, it took all of those things and, and eventually we got there. And that's what fuels my search for the origin of gen the genetic code, because I, I have fragmentary ideas about how the problem could be solved. And that's a a conversation for another time, but I know how hard it is. 
but that's why I think it's so fascinating. Like, this is really, really deep. Let's yes. Let's not be afraid of this. Yes. I don't know what happened to, to us as a community to, I guess we're just, we're still staggered by it, maybe. We're like, oof. like, now that we know the cell and the complexities of the cell, I think, yeah, most most scientists, especially in the life sciences, they are very staggered by the question. And and so there, there has been this bit of a mess in the way the field established itself with a lot of people pointing in different directions very strongly. And so I'm hoping that the new generation will be able to, you know, bring back the pieces and tread them together. So in our conversations, something that's come out numerous times is the, the difficulty of being an origin of life researcher, um, how discouraging it can be at times, and how much courage it takes. And, and plus, it's a very expensive thing to undertake. Like, you don't just pour chemicals in your bathtub and do origin of life experiments. You need very expensive equipment and very smart people and very careful measurements. Can, can you give us a picture what it's like to be inside your skin and trying to solve these problems while juggling a career and getting funding and dealing with university politics and all the rest? What's it like on the inside of your origin of life communities? What are people up against? To be perfectly honest, if they are not tenured, they are against the whole of academia, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As soon as they are tenured, uh, they have some more safety to say what they want and to publish what they want. Now, I'm still an early career researcher. In fact, I don't know if I wanna be tenured or not. But being in my skin is having a lot of courage, going through a lot of hurdles of not being able to speak up because that's the way that academia has been built with a huge power dynamics that is uh, very strongly established. So it's very hard to, to get in that. Uh, I did it with resilience and with the community of others like me and we came together and we put together this organization, you know, about Olin. I yeah, talk, recommend... talk a little bit about that organization. Yes, I recommend everyone to check out oolen.org, Olin. It's the Origin of Life Early Career Network. It was a space that we created to be able to have discussions and many of our PIs wouldn't talk to each other. And we wanted to talk to each other, irrespective of RPIs, ad dominance, and so on. So we created a space and it has been steadily growing from four people to 150 something now, all over the world in five continents. And it, it's just, I think that was what really helped me in the past five, 10 years that I've been working. And the origin of life was to come together with other young people that know a lot that I don't and to be humble enough and to see them being humble enough. And I really think this is how we, we change the paradigm of how this research is conducted. Is it's not going to be just one person. We need the expertise of multiple people and we need humility. And so... Yeah, walking my path was not always easy. Now it's a bit better. After I met Stu, he was a great mentor to me. Dennis Noble, uh, Nick Lane. Mm -hmm. So mentors are very important and, and the community is very important. But it's not easy, as you said. I mean, some people can do some research in the origin of life without spending a lot of money. It's possible. But ultimately to actually do experiments that will prove your theories, you will need a load of money. So explain more about that. What, why does it cost so much money to do origin of life research and give us an idea of what is the scale of the resources needed for that? 
Yeah, well, we're, we're talking about nanotechnology here, right? We're talking about really small things um, at really small quantities, some of them. For instance, the amount of a vitamin in the cell is so, so, so small. That's why if, if you go do a test uh, to check your vitamins now, at least here in Europe, you will pay 300, 400 mm. uh, just to detect your vitamins. Um, yeah. It's really expensive. It's hard. So, And we're talking just about one type of molecule. Then you have to stabilize others, to analyze them. And it's many, many small molecules. The idea of trying to do a one-pot experiment where you see this whole thing evolving, it's still very far. We, we don't know how... Um, which condi conditions, it's still very far. So we need to work with everyone that does it individually, with RNA networks, with small molecule networks, with membranes, and they're all spending a lot of money <laughs> in their own places. So the scale is enormous, but I'm hoping the technology will advance and uh, that will be able to come together. So there is a new paper coming out from Olin soon. We're in the final stages of writing it, it's become almost like a book <laughs> that is uh, about data-driven origins research. So we're talking about all the methodology that you can use with all types of molecules. I hope that will be a resource for, for the community, that they will understand what implies what everyone else is doing, when, what methods they're using. And, I am very familiar with how hard it is to break in to the conversations in science with tenured professors and, and all of that. And uh, I'm forming a picture as I talk to you. So there, there's a, let's call it the establishment, for better, for worse, there's good people, there's bad people, but there's, there's the, the way things are, right? And then you have uh, undergrads, graduate students, postdocs, people that aren't professors yet or people in the very early stages of their research careers. And that's what Olin is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's 20, 30 something people who they don't have all the levers and they don't have all the resources and they've decided we're gonna collaborate. We're, I mean, you've got papers with 20 or 30 authors on them, right? Yeah, the first paper. This next one will have probably the same. Yeah. How do you see that culture? So imagine that group of people 10 years from now, 20 years from now. How do you envision the culture being different than it is today? That's a good question. You know, answering that, I think we have to not forget about the whole context of academia today and how it's breaking apart. Right? Mm. Okay. So I think there will be a much larger role for private endeavors to play, be either a separate department or the whole of it, but still working in an open source, open data. I, I don't think this will all be happening within academia. I don't see all of Olin's members uh, just becoming professors and that's it. Mm. I actually think maybe half of us will not. Mm. And whatever we end up we end up doing, I still believe we'll have the expertise and we'll still have the the will to engage with each other and, and help each other, which means helping the whole. Because we really have this this collective thinking that I didn't I don't think it existed before. Okay, so you you use the phrase breaking apart. You said academia is breaking apart. What is going on? Many more graduates without prospects of work, salaries dropping when compared to inflation, precarity, prices for publishing in good journals skyrocketing. Those journals are one of the most lucrative businesses in the world. People are very frustrated with that. It's almost like feels like a parasite is eating on us. Uh, Mm. Um, the power dynamics people don't tolerate it anymore people don't tolerate professors screaming at them just because they can 
you know, I think there's a lot going on. Uh, it's so much. It's and really a moment of rupture. It's really, I think it's a moment of rupture. Like, and you're alluding to, you feel like privately funded endeavors are on the rise and that it's not just going to be the traditional scientific structure that is doing basic science. Absolutely. I mean, we have the example of AlphaFold that came out of DeepMind of Google. Hmm. And I think that was an important moment for all of us. It really puts in, puts in our faces like, wait a minute, these guys did it. We've been saying for 10 years that it's impossible to solve structures in the computer. That's what I learned in school in, in university, you know, yeah. and now they come out and they're like, here it is guys. And then we actually make it for free for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I think it was an important moment. And like, like those, I hope to see many more because we need a lot of money and a lot of resources. And I don't, I don't see change even being possible in universities, even if a Dean wants there are probably many goodwilled deans and people in power. You just cannot change, even by changing your own university, you cannot change the global system of academia, the mm. way it's functioning. So Joanna, is it reasonable to suggest that like the, the problems that people are already aware of in higher education with student loans getting out of control and costs getting out of control and administration getting out of control. You're referring, well, there's a research version of all of this and it's very bureaucratic and there's no way that the world is gonna keep doing it that way. Is that really, is that fair? I think so. And I actually, you were one of the seeds for me thinking like this. Um, but I, since we had those conversations, uh, I, I've been observing it, you know, in the field here in London, I, I would say I'm very privileged to be in London because there's so much going on um, mm -hmm. in the private sector and so on. So it's just, I, I see it. Uh, and it's a natural way of things to evolve. So you also alluded to publishing um being like a big parasite so science publishing is roughly a one or two billion dollar industry mostly run by nature and elsevier right and i learned this firsthand because when i published my paper i had to pay a three thousand dollar fee so that it would be open access instead of only being accessible to subscribers because only a few scientists would ever see my paper and nobody else would. Well, then the U.S. government just came out with this announcement that I think in 2026 or something like that, all U.S. funded research has to be open access. What, what does that mean? And how is that going to unfold? What, what's your crystal ball, Joanna? It's going to create pressure. Um, it's the same has happened in Europe, something like that. So the biggest funding agency in Europe, yeah, the RC, the Horizon programs, what they did was they told everyone, listen, you have to make it open access. And they created their own journal. There is now a journal from the RC, mm. which only people funded by the RC can write in. But so that's, that's a good start. W what I'm wondering is, the U.S. could do the same, just create a, a journal for NSF-funded um, projects. What I'm wondering is how we'll let go of this attachment to the prestige of nature and science, because it, it's so ingrained. And I still think people will continue to pay as much as they can just to be there, because just it's, wow, it's nature or science. So if we don't move this prestige elsewhere to a place that is cheaper and more like, like what it was before, before it was mostly university journals, like the Royal Society mm. uh, here in England is one of them. So maybe we can do that, transfer that prestige back somewhere where they're not exploiting us. <laughs> um, 
if we do that, that will be a major advance. But I don't, I don't know. I don't see how that transition can occur. It's so ingrained in people's minds. So I have a concern with this, and, and here's what it is. I remember in the in the late 90s when and early 2000s when blogging was coming along, a lot of people were suggesting that bloggers were going to replace reporters and we were going to get more accurate news because we were going to get rid of the biases of the media. Um, well, in my opinion, what happened with the internet was the internet just destroyed the media um, and it made it worse, not better. And now, yeah, there's plenty of bloggers or different versions of bloggers, right? Social media influencers and everything. But now the news is extremely biased and it's like, well, do you want the right version or the left version of the news? Um, and the quality of journalism has plummeted and I don't like the existing um, dictatorships but I'm afraid that getting rid of them will only make science worse the way that it's made journalism worse and I don't have an answer yes have you what what thoughts do you have about that it's it's a very hard question. Um, what we have to think also is these journals don't always have the best science. They just have the budget to market it and they actually follow trends. And so, of course, a lot of really good science gets there, but there's a lot of really good science that doesn't. So I, I think the same can happen. Um, just elsewhere than these journals, you know. Um, I don't know where the prestige will fall, but I think there are a lot of um, young, motivated people actually thinking about this problem. And I could suggest a couple to you thinking about how to revolutionize publishing and and to make it more fair. It's a very hard problem, as as you noticed. Well, I. A, a, a couple of years ago, I didn't know you very well back then. Um, you were one of the first people that I asked this question to, but I, I got not only you, but probably at least 10 other scientists. I just said, hey, will you have a Zoom call with me and talk to me about science publishing and funding? And I asked a whole bunch of scientists on a scale of one to 10, one being good, 10 being bad, how bad is science publishing? And the average number I got was seven. <laughs> and I, I, I got in from every single person, I got an hour of ranting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, it's, it's like trying to wear away rock. The odds are stacked against you. They, they don't accept new ideas. Uh, they're, they're mired in dogmas. Uh, the peer, problems with peer review, it, it, was, it was really enlightening. And I thought, wow, well, you're never going to get science to be what it needs to be if the publishing channels are that bad. Absolutely. I can, I can tell you that journals are really pretty much any journal, big journal, little journal, prestigious journal, not prestigious journal. They're all little good old boys, good old girls clubs. Mm. Yeah. Like, well, who, who are your friends? Mm. Yeah, who, that happens yeah. a lot. Right? Um, and, and if you have a good editor, You'll, you'll probably get a good journal. But if if you have an editor with a lot of biases or whatever, you're just going to get. Yeah. Well, Barry, you just reminded me of one thing that I think everyone can do in their universities, 
people that are in hiring committee, committees, this is really easy to change. It's stop making papers the currency of a scientist's value. If Ooh. this would happen, <laughs> you know, that's the thing. Like, I'm not my papers only. I was lucky. I, of course, worked hard. Um, but like, get me in an interview and talk with me. See how much of a good lecturer I am. See what I know about my science. See who else I know, who else I work with. And they all say, oh, yeah, we take all that into account. But in the end, is where's your nature paper? Wow. You don't have any, you don't have any hit paper. Oh, you're, you're co-first author in this paper. Does that mean that you didn't work in this paper as much as the other co-first author? Like, people go to degrees of, oh, it's so Orwellian. It's like, I, science is so much more than that. And it's our fault and now we're pay, our academia's fault and now we're paying for it because we made it the currency. And that's so easy to change. And that can actually change from the bottom up within any university out there. Just don't hire people based on the number of papers they have and where they publish them. Talk with them. See if they will be good professors, if they will be good mentors. One can only hope. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's just this really interesting irony. So, I, Joanna, I don't know if you know this, but marketers know that Google started because Larry and Sergey were trying to quantify uh, uh, some kind of a mathematical problem of science papers being cited by other scientists. Like an important scientific paper has lots of science, uh, citations from other scientific papers. And so they were trying to make this map, like a, a graph of, you know, which, which papers reference which other papers, therefore which papers are the most important. And so the number of citations was, they were measuring all that. And they decided as a proxy for this, that instead of doing scientific paper citations, they would just download the entire internet onto a big hard drive and measure websites pointing to other websites. And they accidentally found out that they had created a fantastic search engine. I did not know that. And that is where Google came from. Wow. And then, and then somebody looked at that and they go, well, I'll give you $100,000 of venture capital for that. And they started raising money. And it was, it was a better metric than for a search engine, uh, backlinks were a better metric than just going on phrases, right? Mm -hmm. And um, which keyword phrases are also in scientific papers because the scientists figured this out a, a long time ago, right? Okay, so I've spent the last 20 years being a Google guy, right? And one of the problems with the internet is that a search engine can tell you whether a web page has a lot of links from a lot of other web pages or whether it gets a lot of tweets or whether it gets a lot of Facebook. You can measure all that. It doesn't mean it's any good, right? I mean, and this is the bane of any honest marketer. There's a lot of people in the world who sell stuff that's really good and they are really honest people. And there are a lot of people who sell stuff in the world who game the system any which way they can. And machines cannot tell the difference. And so this obsession with numbers is, it's, it's one of the major reasons why we have the polarization of social media. If mm. you optimize the New York Times for the number of clicks and the number of reads, you're gonna get an echo chamber that converges on a certain way of thinking. And if you optimize Fox News for the same thing, you're gonna get a different way of thinking with a different group of people. And now you're gonna have two groups of people who can't even talk to each other. And isn't this exactly the problem we have in science? Yes, it's it's become such a simplified measuring way. And the problem is scientists don't like qualitative measuring. 
Right. And I think in the media, it would be the same. Like, it would be like, is this, does this have quality, what we're saying? <laughs> or will it just get the highest number? So I'm, I'm ashamed as a community that scientists fell into this trap because we should know better. We should know better, right? Well, it's just need- our obsession with measuring with numbers. It's just, that's not what people are. Any good scientist knows how important it is to bring keen judgment to the table. And you have to know which data to throw away and which data to look at. And the the data itself cannot tell you that. You have to use your experience and your sense. Well, okay, so we're talking to a woman who has a vision of research, not just universities, and not just origin of life research, but research in general, uh, being a very different animal 10 or 20 years from now than what it is. And you've, you're one of the founders of Olin, which is now a community of 150 young origin of life researchers. Uh, you're working on lots of interesting projects. You're work, writing papers with very prestigious people. So, Age 34, not too bad. I'm grateful. Ultimately, I, that's what I try to practice every day, gratitude. And that's what keeps me on together with all the bright young minds that I, I meet on the way. Uh, and a couple of not young, but very, very bright minds. Yes. Whom are Stuart Kaufman and Dennis Noble currently. Yes. You know, I, I've got a small but very important collection of people in their 70s and 80s that keep me on track. And they are some of the most valuable people in the world. Yes, yes. And I would like to recommend to your readers, if they haven't, to your listeners, if they haven't read this book, The Music of Life by Dennis Noble, they should. Agreed. It's a very, very... Uh, optimistic and uh, beautifully written piece of literature about Uh, life. And Joanna, how can people follow you on social media, keep up with you, look at your work? Thank you very well. I'm in, I'm on Twitter only. Uh, I don't, I try not to spend too much time online, but I have my website uh, jcxavier.org and everything is there my connections on uh, twitter and you can talk to me through there and yes anyone i'm i'm very glad to to connect so glad to to hear from you well i i think this is fabulous i think you're doing great work you're definitely one of the brightest people i've met in the origin of life field and uh, let's imagine a much better culture of science Uh, and it's possible we're making it one day at a time one choice at a time one friendship at a time one paper at a time and um thank you for your part you're doing good. thank you thank you perry